Welcome to Reason and Theology, everyone. I'm your host, Michael Lofton, joined by co-host William Albrick and also returning guest, uh, Dr. Lee Martin McDonald. How are you, Dr. McDonald? Good to have you back on. I'm good. Thank you. It's good to be back with you. Excellent. Today we're discussing the canon, uh, in particular the canon in the early church and also Middle Ages. But before we get to it, let me go ahead and introduce Dr. McDonald formally. Uh, Dr. Lee McDonald is the President Emeritus and Professor of New Testament Studies at Acadia Divinity College and past president of the Institute for Biblical Research. He is the author uh, and editor of over 30 books and more than 160 articles and essays and writes extensively on canon formation, including the canon debate. So uh, Dr. McDonald, uh, to say the least, is an expert in the canon of the Old and New Testament. So uh, today we're talking about especially the canon of the Old Testament, in particular the Deuterocanonical. is kind of a favorite topic that we like to discuss here on the show. Um, so many questions that I have for you, Dr. McDonald, but let me let me start with this. Um, you know, we we see the early councils in the early church um, in Rome, Carthage, and Hippo. And one of my first questions is, um, when it comes to, let, let's start with Rome. Does Rome there in 382, was this actually a council or was this a decree of uh, Pope Damasus? And then number two, um, did it actually include all 73 books of the uh, Catholic canon, or did it exclude Baruch? Well, excellent questions. And uh, I've actually uh, started uh, uh, doing uh, an article for, uh, uh, I'm trying to think of the name right now, uh, De Gruyter, uh on uh, the Western uh, uh, councils. Uh, mm -hmm. There was a council possibly before then at uh, the Council of Laodicea, mm -hmm. and uh, it mentions some of the uh, 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 rather non-canonical writings. I say non-canonical in the sense that uh, they're not a part of the Hebrew Bible, but uh, they are a part of uh, early Christianity. Uh, the uh, Council, uh, there's seven, I think it's seven in one of the references and nine in another, uh, at the councils of Hippo and then subsequently Carthage. Hippo's information was lost, and uh, we found it. Uh, it's uh, repeated in uh, 397 at the Council of Carthage, and then repeated again and clarified in 416 to 419 at another council. And it's fairly close to the uh, council, and I, I take uh, the 382 council in Rome as a council, uh, not simply one person's uh, uh, ideas, though yeah. that's, a debatable, that's a debatable question, but uh, uh, Rome and uh, Carthage were the two largest communities of Christians in the Greco-Roman world at that time, and uh, they had the celebrated uh, uh, scholars, uh, starting with Tertullian and Cyprian, and then, of course, Augustine, uh, all from that region, and uh, they all cited uh, what's now called the Deuterocanonicals or the uh, uh, disputed books that uh, Protestants don't accept. Uh, feel free to follow up on your question because I'm not sure if I'm getting there yet. Did all three of the uh, councils here, um, Rome, Carthage, and Hippo, uh, from what we know of them, did it seem to be the case that they all accepted the same canon? And did some of these accept uh, an extra book of Ezra, you know, that is not Ezra and Nehemiah? Oh, well, very good. Uh, let me just say that uh, Rome and Carthage were connected at the hip. And uh, even at the uh, councils, uh, the 397 and the 416 uh, to 419 councils, there's debates over whether it's 416 or 419, uh, those councils all indicated that they would have to go transmaritime, which means over the sea, to make sure that they were acceptable to the uh, community in Rome. So Rome had a significant impact on uh, the leadership of Carthage. Uh, there were very few questions that they disagreed on. There, there were some, but not that many. I'm sorry. Uh, but on the scope of the, the books, I, I had a list uh, 
uh, in front of me that uh, shows uh, that they're pretty much uh, in agreement uh, on almost all of the books. But uh, one of the things that you'll find a difficulty in uh, getting or have some difficulty in getting is uh, any two lists that are exactly the same. The closest you come to it are uh, uh, Hippo and uh, Carthage. But uh, the various lists and council meetings that uh, uh, conferred, they were all local councils, not ecumenical councils until you get to Trent, but that was Catholic. So it, it couldn't really be called an ecumenical council, it's ecumenical in terms of the Catholics at that time. Uh, they all had uh, lists of books that they accepted. And uh, the closest uh, to the uh, Council of Trent is what was done at Hippo, which may have had antecedents and because historically uh, Rome 382 uh, did come before the uh, Hippo uh, and the uh, Carthage conferences. So uh, the exact number of books varies from council to council. And uh, most of the time they uh, accept uh, second, uh, first and second Esdras, sometimes only first Esdras, which is essentially the end of Chronicles and uh, the book of Ezra, uh, books of Ezra and Nehemiah. But uh, second Esdras uh, also has some Christian contributions to it. And uh, it's the apocalypse of Ezra, uh, which is chapters three to 14. And then the Christian editions are probably chapters one and two, and then 15 and 16. Uh, but uh, uh, those are still uh, uh, for Ezra as in the uh, Vulgate Bibles, even in some recently published ones. So uh, they were highly prized and they're often cited. Uh, the the uh, uh, chapters three to uh, 14, which is for Ezra, uh, uh, those terms and designations get a little confusing to the lay people, but uh, the, the four Ezra is essentially second Esdras, uh, the core of it, and uh, it has a number of things to say about Ezra reconstituting the uh, books that were lost in the destruction of Jerusalem in 586 BC. Now, how come they weren't accepted at Florence and Trent, at least to my understanding, uh, if they were accepted by some of these early councils? That's an excellent question, and I don't have an answer for it. Uh, uh, the uh, primary issue at uh, uh, Trent was to address the questions that Protestants were having on the scope of the church's scriptures. And uh, Martin Luther, of course, wanted to get rid of almost all of the uh, uh, deuterocanonical books, but and they weren't called deuterocanonical at Trent. Uh, it's about 10 years later with Sextus. But uh, those books were uh, looked upon as suspicious to uh, Martin Luther. And uh, though he did say some of them were okay to read, and his people wouldn't allow him to publish his Bible without including them, but he couldn't stand Second uh, uh, Maccabees because it opened up the possibilities of praying for the dead. And... Uh, uh, as you see at the tail end of uh, Second Maccabees, right, chapter fourteen. Yeah. I, yeah. yeah. Um, another question that I've been curious about, and that is, did Jerome, towards the end of his life, um, begin to warm up or or accept the Deuterocanonicals as scripture, since the the church seemingly ruled against them and made him include them in the Vulgate? Um, or did he hold to the very end these were not scripture? Well, interesting. That's a very good question. Uh, Jerome, of course, was from the West and spent time in Rome himself before he came out to uh, Bethlehem. And uh, uh, Jerome wanted to uh, exclude all of the deuterocanonical books, though he did say it was okay to read a few, but uh, there's one text that I have in an article I wrote not too long ago that where he says uh, to a mother and her daughter, uh, Lydia, I think, uh, not Lydia, but Lydia, uh, he said, uh, you would be better off not to read any of them. <laughs> and so uh, I don't have anything beyond that, uh, beyond uh, uh, what Jerome thought toward the end of his journey but uh, his life, 
but he did uh, uh, separate. Uh, he called apocryphal what uh, uh, ca- uh, Protestants call apocryphal. He just wanted to reject all of that uh, that literature, and uh, and uh, similarly, uh, Cyril of Jerusalem uh, had a similar view, and Rufinus, though Rufinus was willing to allow some of them to be read. Uh, earlier, Athanasius, uh, 367, in his uh, 39th uh, edition of his uh, festal letter to let people know when to celebrate uh, Easter, uh, uh, he listed uh, the books, uh, but he made uh, non-canonical the uh, deuterocanonical books. But he only has, I think, seven or eight of them. I don't have the text in front of me right now. But uh, I could get that for you if you like very quickly. But uh, uh, Athanasius said these could be read, and then he adds to it the Shepherd of Hermas, uh, which is interesting. But uh, he says that the books were not canonical. In other words, they're not inspired scripture, uh, but uh, they could be read with some profit. Uh, but he distinguished them, and the Orthodox have pretty well followed over the years something fairly close to Athanasius' uh, comments. He spoke about them being readables. Uh, the Greek term is uh, uh, nos kamena, uh simply a readable text. It's okay to read them, but don't uh, base your doctrine on them. <clears throat> yeah. Orthodox actually use them in their liturgies, but uh, they do not call them equal scriptures to the rest. The Catholics, in fact, do, but uh, the Orthodox do not. Yeah. They're very close to the uh, Episcopal Church that uh, says they're good to read, but don't put a base any doctrine or primary Christian teaching on them. Yeah, exactly. Our early Anglicans uh, held, held that position. Um, yeah, so many places that I want to go with this, but you know, as as curious you brought up Athanasius, to my recollection, he includes Baruch among the inspired scriptures and yet uh mentions Esther as one of the readables. <laughs> and so Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. He reflects what was quite popular in um uh early Christianity. Uh Esther was a disputed book, not only among uh the Christians, but also among the Jews. And it was not easily right. accepted, uh, uh, even in the rabbinic tradition. But uh, some of the uh, lists uh, do not have Esther at all. Some of the canonical lists uh, provided by the Christians. And uh, you're quite right. Uh, Athanasius did not include Esther in his canonical list. And occasionally I hear people saying we must accept only Athanasius New Testament. And I said, so why do you exclude his Old Testament? Well, I know right. why. It's because it's not exactly like the Protestant Old Testament canon. Right. You know, um, if, if it is the case that the Septuagint included the Deuterocanonicals, and if it is the case that the New Testament often quotes from the Septuagint, um, why is it that the canon was still in dispute in the early church um, among Christians? Wouldn't they just say, hey, look, here, here's our Septuagint, here it is, it's right in there. Well, that assumes that we knew all of the books that were in the Septuagint. Uh, nowadays, it's very easy for us to assume that the Rolf's uh, translation or uh, uh, Greek uh, text of the uh, Septuagint is the only thing that mattered and existed. And that's not the case. Uh, There's no strong arguments that saying that the books in in the Roth's uh, Septuagint are the only books that anybody read. So uh, I've raised some questions about that uh, uh, in some of my own writings that uh, why do we assume uh, right now is very similar and I've equated the Greek New Testaments that we currently have uh, try to find one of them in the ancient world that looks exactly like that. There, there, there is none. Uh, they, uh, what we have are a collection of texts, and uh, the text-critical scholars have put together a work that they think is uh, what it looked like. The same is true. Uh, the Septuagint, the largest collection of the Septuagint that we have is Christian. I mean, the Christians 
uh, put it together. And uh, the largest in the ancient world that we have would be Codex Alex Alexandrinus. Uh, the others, uh, Sinaiticus and Vaticanus, are missing uh, several of the books. And uh, Vaticanus breaks off and it doesn't have, uh, it has a number of the deuterocanonical books or the disputed books, the Septuagint books that are not in the Hebrew Bible. But those, uh, those writings, uh, you raise an excellent question, but uh, be careful not to assume too much about what we already know from uh, the modern Greek uh, text. Uh, a former, uh, I wanna say, I'd love to say a student of mine, he's not a student, but he worked for me, uh, uh, Ken Penner has put together a new translation of the uh, Septuagint. And I love it, uh, what he has done with it, but he also uh, is very aware that we don't have anything that remotely uh, resembles a full text in the early churches uh, for quite some time. Uh, really not until you get to the parish Bibles, those are in Latin, but they're based on uh, the uh, Septuagint books that, uh, uh, and some of the, there's a number of the Hebrew texts that are also cited in there, but the, uh, the Hebrew uh, books are not the limits of the Septuagint. So uh, Ken Penner has written in his Lexham uh, new translation that just came out, actually he used several scholars, but he is in charge of it. Uh, he's put together, uh, I think, uh, a very nice refreshing collection of uh, uh, the texts that uh, comprise what we think is the Septuagint as it originally existed. As you know, it was put together over a long period of time, uh, probably around uh, two, uh, 220 or 30 years. And so uh, there may be texts that have survived in early Christianity that didn't have all of the texts that were in there. So that's... Uh, you will have great difficulty looking at any church council or listing of and canon lists uh, the deuterocanonical books or the uh, Septuagint books that include non-Hebrew uh, Bible books. You'll have difficulty uh, finding a complete list of those. Yeah, have I made that more. Yeah, more no. Yeah, absolutely. I th I think that. Um, every list that I've seen, there's maybe at least one or two books that they're silent about. Maybe it's included in another book like Baruch. Maybe it's included uh, with Jeremiah yep. limitations. We don't know. But there's no list that exactly 100% matches up with anybody's canon that I'm aware of. But hey, I'm willing to stand corrected. Uh, you're absolutely correct. Yeah. And mm -hmm. the Catholics have uh, fewer books uh, in their uh, Deuterocanonicals then do the uh, Orthodox, who have three to four more, depending on which list that you look uh, at. Right. But it's interesting that the Deuterocanonicals, and I, I, I gave some lectures in Russia, and they were actually calling them Deuterocanonicals because they got tired of their own designation. It was too long. Uh, they have the uh, non canonical uh, Old Testament scriptures, is what they call them. And uh, then they shortened it to readables, but uh, even their lists, and I went to a library and looked at various of their translations into Russian, and I was surprised that they didn't all have the same books, and they didn't have the same order of those books. Right. But yeah. uh, well, it's no, very ahead. difficult to find, it's very difficult to find anybody in antiquity that has a collection of all of the books and the church fathers don't cite all of them either and it could be not because they uh, weren't uh, in favor of them as they may not have had a copy of them and they may have only heard of them yeah russia is kind of a an, an oddball when it comes to this discussion just because you know the, the philaret catechism seems to exclude the Jewish and and that's where some of that is coming from. But then some Russians will still say, yeah, but they're still part of scripture. And so there's, there's this kind of odd position that the Russian church seemingly 
uh, takes. But there's so much more I want to discuss, but I want to get um, William and also we're joined here by uh, Gary Machuda. I want to give them a chance to, to dive in. So I'm first going to go to William and then uh, Gary, who's, who's been waiting in the background, we'll, we'll have you uh, come on here in just a minute. Okay. Yeah, okay. incredible. To very, feel great to be with all you gentlemen. You're a very, very intelligent gentleman. I have a few questions I'd like to pick your uh, brain on, uh, um, Dr. McDonald. Uh, by the way, uh, thank you for joining us again. A great pleasure and honor to have you here again. And I, I agree with um, a lot of what you said. Very, very fascinating that um, despite the fact that maybe we, we, we examine, for instance, a few apostolic fathers and uh, maybe a number of them don't utilize all of what, what I would, what Catholics call a uh, deuterocanon. But as I've, as I've talked to you about before, Dr. McDonald, we clearly have a vision in the apostolic church, and definitely the Nicene, pre-Nicene church and onward, of the church utilizing them as holy writ. So l let me ask you this. Uh, did Martin Luther know that the position he was taking was overwhelmingly against the consensus of the early church? Well, you would know more about Martin Luther than I do, so I've, I've looked at what he has to say about uh, the Deuterocanonical books and also about some of the books he didn't like in the New Testament uh, itself. Uh, the New Testament was pretty well largely f affirmed by his time, but uh, uh, not totally among all of the Christians. The Arminians continued to have 3rd Corinthians and then the uh, Repose of the Blessed Disciple, which is John the Apostle, speaking about his death. And they had a number of things besides that. And the longest collection is the Ethiopian Bible. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, he wouldn't have known about the Ethiopians because they were hidden for almost a thousand years behind the uh, Muslim uh, influence and that uh, people couldn't have access to them. But uh, did he know? Yes, he knew. And in fact, uh, uh, I've written uh, a couple of things on him citing a couple of the uh, deuterocanonical texts, uh, but he stayed far away. He couldn't stand Second uh, Maccabees, but he thought some of them were okay. He didn't want to include them in his Bible, but the Germans were too much in favor of them. Uh, even the the uh, Protestant tradition didn't follow through as yeah. uh, I think Luther would have wanted. And that was true for several centuries uh, after the Protestants began their, their journey in uh, trying to establish their own Bibles. Uh, uh, most of them still continued, some or all of uh, the... Uh, Deuterocanonicals. Uh, the last that we know of is about 1800, uh, and then they went out of style. No later. I think there's uh, one translation, and I, uh, I'll come to it in a moment if I can think of it, that uh, continued them, a Protestant uh, Bible that had some of the uh, uh, Deuterocanonicals as late as 1850. And then wow. they went out of style, and then uh, they came back in 1950 in the uh, RSV translation, Protestants decided to use them, uh, employ them, but they put them where Martin Luther did, namely between the Old and New Testaments, uh, uh, yeah. the uh, Hebrew scriptures and then the uh, the uh, New Testament Greek scriptures. He put them right between the two to say uh, they're really not up to par with the rest, but, uh, uh, but, but he I'm did. But i remove them. Yeah. yeah, well, I don't think he could. Uh, I think... Yeah. Uh, I think the population, uh, he wanted to remove them, but they wouldn't, uh, they wouldn't go for it. So if you want to have a reformation and nobody show up, you probably ought to reconsider some of your positions. Uh, that's, that's a McDonaldism. Sorry. <laughs> no, and that's a great point, Lee. Well, what a fantastic point you make there, because um, as you know quite well, uh, as I've told you before, I, I've debated and I've talked about the issue of the canon Plenty. And in one of my debates that um, I prepared for, not on the canon, but talking about the book of Romans 3, I went ahead and I examined um, a number of German Bibles uh, prior to Luther's, uh, the Luther Bible, and, um, and after that. And I was not able, as you know this, Lee, I was not able to find any that lacked the Deuterocanonical books. 
So but the idea of, yeah. of rejecting them, it, it's very much a novelty. That was not, they were there in all the German Bibles. You look at yeah. the, the most famous one, the Kohlberger Bible, they're there. Yeah. Well, I, I have uh, shared, I have a facsimile of the first King James Bible. Uh, it was given to me by a, a, a well-intended layperson who didn't know what they had. And I, I said, this is remarkable that you have it. I, I know uh, what it says from my study of it, but I don't have a copy. And they said, we want you to have a copy. So I've got it. And I often take it to church groups and then open it up where they can see the, the uh apocryphal books and they're called apocryphal books in that uh, uh, translation and uh, they were very powerful and people liked them and and I have said uh, a, a good friend of mine has written on the apocryphal books quite a bit David De Silva if you don't have his works uh, he is really one of the foremost uh, and upcoming scholars he's a young scholar and has written about four or five books on that subject but uh, he points out their great value, and there's an awful lot we wouldn't know about the context of early Christianity without them, and uh, there's some portions of them that are absolutely beautiful, and uh, yeah. I, I'm, uh, I'm a hopeless Baptist, and uh, uh, I like to read them. So uh, I don't, this, uh, I've encouraged people, and, and I've spoken in Presbyterian, Methodist, Baptist, Assembly of God, uh, independent churches on the formation of the Bible, and I enjoy getting with lay people. They often will ask very pointed and very helpful questions. I said, would you like to be informed by the same literature that informed many of the early Christians? If you would, then read these books. And uh, they were there. There were more books that were excluded from the Hebrew Bible than were included. And uh, there's a, a list of, and I've uh, published a, a list of uh, 22 to 26, and it depends on whether some of them were written by the same person, uh, books that are mentioned in the Old Testament that uh, we have uh, no idea what was in them uh, because they haven't survived. But uh, we've got uh, a number of those. They were written by seers and prophets and uh, the book of Jasher. Uh, so we've lost quite a bit. But uh, the stuff that we do have, uh, most of it, I don't think, is very harmful. And I think it's very helpful. So I encourage people to yeah. read it. Uh, I agree with you, Dr. McDonald. And, and uh, we, as you know quite well, we've talked, I mean, I've talked with you on the phone for hours before just on the Book of Wisdom. So uh, you've told me you love the Book of Wisdom. And I myself love it, love it as well. So you're right. It has, these books have incredible material. But I do want to pick your brain a little bit more. But before I do, I want to hop it on over to, uh, to a very special guest joining us. Uh, Dr. Lee, we have Gary Machuda here. Gary Machuda is a oh, Catholic yep. apologist who has written several books on the Deuteric Canon. And my, one of my personal favorites is called Why Catholic Bibles Are Bigger. He's, a, he's an incredible apologist, incredible author. And I do want to toss it over to him so he can uh, talk to you a bit. Well, thank you. I'm I'm honored to uh, communicate with you in person. I have one of your books on why the Catholic Bibles are bigger. Anyway, yeah. uh, go right well, ahead. Yeah, well, you Doctor, know more the subject than I do. Oh no, no. <laughs> in fact, I was going I was going to thank you for all your work because I have learned so much through your work. Uh, you've challenged me. You pushed me, and. You know, I'm always learning new things, reading and rereading your work. So thank you so much for all, all your hard work that you've done in this area. Well, you're most gracious. I'm going to ask if you could repeat that again if I call my wife in here. So she can... <laughs> <laughs> well, that's okay. My, my, I think my wife's watching the live stream, so she heard your compliment. <laughs> but I'll be glad there to do that. Are. No, I'm joking. I'm joking, of course. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. Um, there's a couple things actually um and i'd love to hear your thoughts on this um over the years i've been looking at josephus in the canon and uh i've run across several scholars who believe that josephus thought that he might be a prophet uh reading um you know prophet written history for a while i didn't buy it but the more i'm looking at the evidence the more i i can see the strength of that position I was just wondering what your position is on that. Uh, I, a, I, 
I don't know that I would call Josephus a prophet, but he is a remarkably intelligent and articulate man with the many volumes uh, that he's uh, produced. And he himself, of course, uh, has cited several of the uh, disputed books or the uh, uh, additional books that are from the Septuagint. Uh, and whether he, uh, in his uh, Against Apian uh, volume, when he lists and identifies categories of scripture, and he lists it at 22 books, uh, and he said, everybody assumes this, or every Jew anywhere would know this, and I, baloney, uh, yeah. the yeah. Melitoasitis had to make a trip from Sardis, which had one of the largest synagogues in antiquity that we know of. And I'd been in that synagogue, the ruins of it, it wasn't as big in Melito's day, but there was a large Jewish population there. And he could have walked across the street and said, hey, folks, could you tell me which books uh, are in your scriptures? Yeah. But he didn't know. And, uh, and he was a bishop. Yeah. And he had to make a long trip. And this is about 180, 170, 180 uh, CE, AD. Uh, why would he make such a trip if everybody knew it and all the Jews could uh, could could tell him? And uh, I think Josephus, who was given to uh, hyperbole on a number of occasions in support of the Jews, uh, there are several examples of that. And Louis Feldman, some years ago, wrote on that very subject, and I followed his. He's a Jewish scholar mm -hmm. and uh, one of the leading Josephus scholars along with Steve Martin now, his, uh, a, a younger protege, uh, I, uh, I agree with them uh, on is that. It, I don't... Is it Martin or Mason? Did I say Martin? Uh, yes. you're, you're right. Mason. Okay. Uh, yeah. He wrote an article for us in the uh, Canon Debate volume. So yeah. Steve Mason, you're correct. Fantastic book, too, by the way. Um, well, thank you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah, you, you mentioned Melito. Uh, I that's exactly how I see Melito. Um, one thing yeah. I've noticed, though, and maybe you can help me understand this, because I see this a lot in scholar, you know, in academic level, is often th whenever they'll see a list of sacred books, they automatically assume that the writer is reproducing either the objective canon or the received canon by Christians. But when I look at Melito of Sardis and other canons, I see evidence that they're, what they're trying to redo, do is reproduce what rabbinical Judaism accepts for evangelical purposes. Uh, do you have any thoughts on why, you know, they seem to ignore that, in, especially the usage by those, uh, by those authors? Well, I think uh, uh, they were influenced uh, when uh, Melito goes to the land where all of this comes about, I think he's going to Jerusalem. Uh, I, it doesn't say in uh, Eusebius exactly the place, but it's to the east in Judah somewhere. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, gets, he gets a list. And it's pretty close to the list that's uh, uh, circulating among the, uh, the second century uh, rabbinic tradition that you find in the Baba Bath or 14b text. But... Uh, uh, that wasn't operative for all Jews at the time, at that time, and even uh, three centuries later, they're still debating certain books that uh, uh, were included eventually, and some that were not, like uh, Sirach, of course. But I like, uh, I like uh, Melito's uh, uh, tradition. Uh, it's a little bit, uh, he, I think he, he ignores or he admits by accident the twelve. But uh, also Esther, I think, is missing from that uh, uh, collection. But uh, the Jews were struggling with Esther up until the end of the second century uh, CE, AD. <clears throat> and then it becomes a normal part of their, uh, their rituals uh, every year in the synagogues. But uh, it wasn't that way, and some of the books were questioned for quite some period of time, like uh, Song of Songs and Ezekiel, because its temple is different in capacity than what you find in the earlier books uh, in, uh, in Torah. 
But uh, I don't know if I'm answering your question or just trying to skirt around it. I'm, I, uh, <laughs> I, I don't uh, Well, yeah, I mean, and, and, you've gone, and you've gone in depth on, you know, the, um, the posi position of, you know, what, what is this list meant to represent? It may not be his own personal list, but it seems to me that this, the extracts were um, basically uh, a tool for Christians to use the dialogue with Jews. And so naturally yeah. you would have to figure out what books do the Jews use so you can evangelize, right? Sure. Well, yeah. one of the things we have to get our heads around is there's no Christian in the second century who's talking about a list, a specific list, these books and no more, yeah. and they don't make argument anywhere, whether Old or New Testament, and and that begins to come out. Uh, uh, Origen is familiar with the Jewish list of 22 books, but he himself didn't buy into it, and he's he likes Susanna, and so did Hippolytus uh, a little bit later. There's a number of people that uh, uh, are talking about books and citing them even as scripture, but they don't have a complete list uh, they nobody formalized the list, and once they did, not everybody agreed with it. Yeah. And the earliest lists start coming out. My feeling is in the fourth century. I don't date the Muratorian fragment, as you possibly know, in the uh, second century. Uh, there's some that think uh, the that list of books, all of those books, were accepted by everybody in the second century and just a few on the edge that uh, the fringe edges that hadn't been accepted yet. But that's not true at all. The Syrians did not accept uh, what's called the minor or Pocock epistles. Uh, uh, second uh, James, I'm sorry, uh, second Peter, second, third John and Jude, and neither did they accept revelation. So uh, those, uh, uh, those collections, are um, not reflective, uh, even the lists of absolutely everybody, because they vary. And uh, you'll find variances in, in all of the lists. I've listed quite a few in my stuff, and then uh, uh, Ed uh, Gallagher and uh, John Mead came out with a book, Oxford University Press published, and I wrote a very nice review of it. Uh, it's a terrific book on the list, and they list uh, as many and I ask them, uh, when are they going to continue on beyond, uh, in a more serious way, beyond the fifth, sixth uh, centuries? And they said, that's volume two. And I said, go for it. Yeah. But uh, and the lists are not complete. And uh, no ecumenical council for the whole church ever addressed the issue. Isn't that interesting? Uh, even the one in the east, uh, the Trollan Council, uh, said, keep going as you are. And uh, there were variations in Old and New Testament uh, books in the churches in the uh, uh, Eastern Orthodox and the Oriental Orthodox. The Oriental Orthodox would be largely Armenia, Syria, uh, the Coptics, uh, Ethiopia, primarily, and some smaller communities uh, outside of that. And the others are largely Eastern Orthodox. They never fought over those issues and uh, when I was giving the lectures in Russia uh, to Orthodox and uh, some Catholic scholars, uh, it was funny. Uh, one of the questions that came up was, uh, why are you folks in the West always talking about the canon? <laughs> and, <laughs> and, I, and I laughed and I said, well, it was one of your folks from the East. Uh, I think they call him Athanasius. Uh, who got it started uh, and got everybody talking about which books are in and which are out. And, and then all kinds of councils begin to come after him and uh, try to settle the issue. There might have been one at uh, Laodicea, 360, give or take, but it wasn't complete until much later. Mm -hmm. uh, those are the kinds of uh, things uh, that we often forget about. Uh, I found uh, uh, the uh, when I was in... Uh, Russia, I went to some Orthodox churches, and I asked some of the uh, uh, priests and uh, the uh, professors uh, that came to the lectures, uh, why is it that you accept the book of Revelation as scripture, and yet you never read it in your liturgies, and yet you have some other books 
you don't accept the scripture, but you read them regularly in your liturgies. And, uh, you know, they all had a good chuckle and a good laugh and said, nobody's consistent. What's your problem? Anyway, uh, I, I think, I think uh, there's more fluidity in the formation of the canon than what we uh, realize. I just wrote an article for uh, Hebrew Studies, uh, and uh, they wanted me to write on fluidity in the formation of the Hebrew Bible. And that's easy to do because it's very fluid on the edges for quite some time. And uh, Josephus didn't settle the matter. He spoke about it. And then the next incidence is that Baraita, written somewhere around 180 to uh, 200 uh, uh, CE AD, uh, and uh, not every Jew accepted what was in that. That's why it wasn't included in the Mishnah. And it was included in the Babylonian Talmud later on, but it didn't represent all Jews everywhere. And one of the things about the Jewish scriptures, uh, there were two Jews, uh, Edre, uh, uh, oh, I'm trying to think of his last name, and then Mendel, uh, two Jewish scholars gave lectures at Princeton, and I was invited to give a lecture there, and I was blown away by their lectures. They said that there was a continental divide between the East uh, and the West, and the uh, East started at Jerusalem and went East over to Babylon, and everything south and west of there uh, used the Septuagint. And so they had uh, examples galore of Jewish uh, uh, teachers still using non-canonical uh, from their current perspective, but uh, the uh, Septuagint uh, books, Deuterocanonicals, well into the ninth century AD. Yeah. I, I Wow, that uh, I hadn't thought of that. And they said in the, in, the rabbis taught always in Hebrew, but the people to the west and the south didn't know Hebrew. Only to the east could uh, there be Aramaic or Hebrew. And uh, so they taught for that community, and uh, there were no yeshivas, uh, yeshivas, uh, uh, Jewish schools uh, up until about the ninth century AD in the West. So what scriptures would the people have had? It would be whatever uh, copies of the Greek translations or the Latin translations that they had. There was an old Latin translation of the, of the Old Testament, uh, probably around 200 AD, but uh, they were, um, those would be the books that the people had. And we shouldn't assume in the synagogues that it was any different than in the churches. Most churches didn't have more than a handful of the scriptures uh, because A, it was expensive to make a copy and uh, not everybody knew what ones were out there. And uh, they're largely copied by, with some good exceptions, but largely by uh, uh, not, uh, I, wanna, I wanna use a term, it's not illiterate, but uh, uh, people who are amateur writers uh, making copies of scriptures. And Augustine makes reference to that. Anybody that knew uh, both languages thought they had a right to make a copy of scripture and they translated terribly. But the churches, for the most part, uh, looking at the earliest translations that we have, and Bruce Metzger at Princeton put together a collection of those, um, and it was amazing to me that most of them only had maybe one gospel, sometimes two, and uh, they'd have uh, some of the uh, writings of Paul, but generally not all of them. And uh, sometimes they would have uh, uh, the book of Acts and uh, uh, First Peter and First John. Uh, those were very popular, uh, but most of the churches wouldn't have even that much. So... Uh, the uh, there's an excellent uh, article, and I'll think of the name of it in a moment. But uh, uh, Miller is the fellow who wrote it in a feshrift for a uh, uh, John Meyerdorf, and he talks about uh, uh, the title of that is I'm looking at it now: New Perspectives on Historical Theology. But he says that the scriptures that were known in the churches. Uh, and I think he's right, were those that were read to them from the lectionaries 
Uh, and most of the people only had portions of those books read to them. And the lectionaries that have survived are seldom ever complete, and you don't have a whole collection of every uh, lectionary on every book of uh, the Bible. So, uh, by the way, that's still true today. And I've chided people, I have some friends that make lectionaries, and I said, how come you don't have anything on the book of Revelation in your in your lectionary, but you haven't taken it out of your Bible? Uh, that fluidity is what you find in Judaism and in Christianity for centuries. Uh, we often have this feeling that as soon as John the Apostle wrote uh, the gospel, and uh, I don't think John the Apostle wrote the book of Revelation, but when Revelation was written, everybody knew this is the Bible. That is total nonsense. Uh, there's some people that I think, uh, they're good, well thought scholars, but they allow their theology to control the evidence. And I've asked, uh, how is it if everybody knew what was in their Bibles, uh, their first uh, uh, testament, the Old Testament, uh, how come nobody had a list of it uh, for several centuries? And they said, well, they got away from the Lord. And I said, uh, I, I think there's a better explanation is maybe they didn't know all of what we know today. Yeah. Uh, we've had several centuries to put it together. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Actually, you, I'm just going to ask one more question, then I'll, I'll pass it over to uh, William and Michael. Um, you actually anticipated one of my questions. I was going to mention that uh, there's evidence, in Jewish sources of Aramaic, uh, even wisdom in Aramaic and uh, Maccabees in Aramaic. And uh, now here's my thoughts and, and correct me if I'm wrong, because I, I might be very wrong because I, I don't really know very much about later Judaism. But if these texts were in Aramaic, the, would, that would be unpointed, right? They wouldn't have vowel points. Oh, the vowel points are much later. Uh, the Masoretic vowel points come in really around the end of the 6th, 7th century. Uh, uh, and, uh, and I'm just looking at, uh, uh, they wouldn't have been available for the Talmudic, uh, they're, they're not in the Talmud or whatever until later they're, they're put in, okay. they're later insertions. So yeah. uh, you start seeing them, uh, of course, in the famous uh, Leningrad Cadensis and then the portions that survived in the Aleppo uh, 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 canon that was put together. Uh, not canon, but a collection of uh, Jewish scriptures. Okay. So would that imply that if they're continuing copying these books in Aramaic, that they would memorize the vowel points? And so there would be a, a much greater acceptance of them than, say, just secular literature, if you understand what yeah, I mean. I, I understand your question. Okay. I don't have an answer uh, for it. Um, uh, the vowel points uh, are very common now, of course, and in the Hebrew Bibles, but it's, I, I've been impressed with uh, going to conferences and uh, going to Israel and finding no vowel points, and uh, uh, people think you should know this stuff. And I uh, did a class with Jim uh, Charlesworth at Princeton, and uh, we were looking at the Dead Sea Scrolls, which have no vowel points on them. And it took me a few weeks to get in them because I had five years of Hebrew and it was all with vowel points. And yeah. he said, why do you look at something so lately? Let's get back to what they were doing <laughs> in the time. Of I said, okay, I'll, I'll bite. So uh, he and I did the thing and I talked about the significance of canon on the Dead Sea Scrolls and, and he taught on uh, uh, the translation of the text. And uh, so we all had a good time uh, yeah. translating, but, the vowel points are much later than what uh, you were assuming, I think, uh, uh, in, in the part of the question, if I understood it correctly. Yeah, yeah. so there, there would be a kind of oral tradition of how to point the different text, you know, where to insert the vowels and which vowels. And wow. so, that, yeah. so, so there is more than just, you know, we have a copy of something, this thing needed to be preserved in their heritage. Sure. Yeah. yeah, and how you put vowel points in can determine the significance or meaning of a particular word. Absolutely. Uh, how, how it's pointed, as you know that. And uh, 
since uh, now I, I I actually think the uh, community of Masoretes who did the Masoretic uh, uh, vowel points uh, they were smarter than I am and <laughs> knew that their Hebrew <laughs> better than I do. Yeah. So they may well have been right. And of course, the context always determines uh, how you uh, would apply. Uh, right. Most of the vowel points that we use in the Greek text were not useful in the uh, uh, unsealed manuscripts, the capital lettered manuscripts. So uh, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of that stuff is later on, and we make assumptions that it was always there, but it, it really wasn't. All right. Well, you know, I, I don't want to hog you for the show. <laughs> I could go on and on. So I'll, I'll yeah, hand I, it over. I, I, you you've got to be amazed at all the ways I can say I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. McDonald, I, I, I have a, a question for you. Please feel free to shoot it down if it doesn't, uh, oh, no. you know. Who's it's talking so, This is Michael, by the way. Oh, okay. Thank you. Uh, so my, my question is, um, do you, do you, are you maybe able to speculate as to why the Jews did not have a set canon by the time of Jesus? Well, why is it that they could not have already had this set? Um, and maybe why is it that Jesus seemed to have thought that they had at least a pretty good grasp on the canon because he held people accountable to what the scriptures said? So, Well, a good question. And uh, I... Uh, raised, I was having a debate with Larry Schifferman, who's a Jewish scholar in uh, New York, and uh, uh, he was thinking that it was all pretty well settled well before the time of Jesus. And I said, so when is the very first time you have a list of the Jewish scriptures? And he just sat and paused uh, for a moment. He was going to mention Josephus uh, about 90 plus or minus uh, CE AD. And, uh, and then he said, you know, that's a good question. I, that's the end of the second century, isn't it? And I said, yes. And I said, if you don't have anybody that makes a list, uh, they only have some categories. You don't know what is in the categories. It's like in the prologue to uh, Sirach, the grandson speaks about the law of the prophets and the others. We have no idea what was in the prophets so he cites a number of them and lists them in uh, uh, in that uh, book, and not not uh, the grandson, but Sirach himself. And uh, but you don't have what the others are. Are the others the writings, as some people want to assume? Uh, we don't we don't know what was there, and whatever the others were, uh, they're never uh, delineated. Nobody has mentioned them. And no one was talking about a fixed biblical canon at the time. Uh, I have uh, tried to make an argument in a recent book. Uh, uh, Stan Porter was one of the editors of it on the uh, uh, influence of Callimachus in uh, the uh, Alexandrian library who made lists of ca uh, canonical uh, authors uh, that were the uh, stars of that particular discipline, and they were like nines and sevens and tens. Uh, but uh, uh, Homer, of course, was right at the tip, tip top of uh, uh, the canonical uh, authors that people would model. And you never would violate that, though if somebody came along with something that was even better, they could add it to it. But that wasn't true of the Christian canons. We don't have any notion of Christian canons until much later than that. And the same thing is true for uh, Jewish uh, scriptures uh, on the formation of the Jewish canon. Uh, there's nobody talking about a biblical canon in the first century or the second century, though you do have the Baraita that lists the books, and that's at about 180 uh, to 200. And it, it's the first time you have uh, law, prophets, and writings but as late as the 5th century, the rabbinics are still calling them the law and the prophets. And I just wrote a book, uh, or rather an article for a book on uh, the writings of the Ketuvim. Uh, it just came out. It's uh, last year, uh, Oxford University's handbook on the writings. And I mentioned that uh, we don't have any evidence that that was settled or what the writings were, probably most of them, because the Psalms are in them, 
were included among the prophets. And you find in the Dead Sea Scrolls where Daniel and the Psalms were looked upon as prophetic writings. Uh, they don't say much about the rest of the uh, uh, Ketuvim or the uh, the writing, but that uh, that literature was uh, uh, open for discussion for quite some period of time. And uh, I think most of the third part of the uh, Old Testament was included in the prophets. And you have examples in the New Testament of uh, uh, Psalms being called a prophetic uh, text. It's found book of Acts. Uh, I don't have the text handy right now, but uh, I don't know if that's getting to your question, but I know that there's some people who say, well, how could they function without a canon? Well, the canon was not at the heart and core of their, of their views. They were talking about scriptures, and there were sacred scriptures, and of course, Torah was at the heart of that, uh, the Pentateuch, uh, which is different than the Torah and the way that it's uh, arranged. But that kind of uh, that kind of discussion just never uh, happened in the first century. The earliest examples that we have of it is in uh, Four Ezra uh, uh, and uh, uh, the Josephus text first uh, against uh, uh, Apian, uh, chapter one thirty-seven to forty-three. But uh, the uh, uh, Four Ezra or Second Ezra, and it's the uh, fourteen. Uh, 24 through 44 uh, text, uh, where he mentions that there were 24 uh, books and 70 others. What were those 70 others? Uh, probably some of those 70 others were books that uh, we now call deuterocanonicals or uh, disputed Septuagint books, or possibly even pseudepigrapha, because we know that Enoch was a very popular book in the, the time in the first century, in the uh, I think uh, Jesus, whether he knew the book or not, he knew some of the traditions in it, and you find that in Matthew uh, 19:28 and 25:31, where he speaks about the Son of Man coming, sitting on the throne, his throne of glory. That phrase is only found in First Enoch in the parables, uh, starting from chapter 47. Uh, that's the kind of the the kind of thing they there was fluidity going on on a uh, a constant basis, but nobody said these books and no others until uh, considerably later. And uh, there was fluctuation in the books in the Hebrew manuscripts. Uh, and one of the things very few people talk about, but it's also very much a part of canon, is the text. Canonical studies are only about the books that we're talking about, but look at how the, the books varied. Uh, the end of John chapter 7 and uh, chapter 8 uh, through verse 11, uh, everybody acknowledges now, New Testament scholars, that that was inserted later. Uh, so it's an insertion into the Gospel of John, and probably also John chapter 21 uh, is a later insertion. Uh, you find that in the insertions in uh, uh, Esther, uh, there's several insertions in the book of Esther that came in and that was eventually canonized. The same thing is true of the uh, additions to Daniel, the uh, the uh, song or uh, prayers, uh, prayerful song of the three young men and then the Susanna and the bell and the dragon. Those are texts that were inserted later into other texts that were looked upon as uh, authoritative and uh, uh, likely scriptural. But those are long stories. Uh, you'll find in the early church, uh, uh, one of the things actually I'm writing on right now is pseudepigrapha <laughs> and uh, how it's common in the classical period, Greco-Roman classical period, uh, Judaism, as well as early Christianity. And it continues on for some period of time. And it, it takes the church a long time to get around to saying these texts, but not those. And generally, the term pseudepigrapha was applied to uh, heresy, and uh, uh, eventually, uh, you found uh, uh, Athanasius in his 39th letter, he speaks of it as apocryphal. It was anything that he saw that was heretical was also apocryphal. And uh, the Catholics and the Orthodox use apocryphal for heretical books, uh, not uh, a Deutero canonical or disputed books. Excellent. Now, um, 
Dr. McDonald, there are a few chat questions if you have a moment to engage them. Go ahead. Okay, the first is from Ave Christus Rex. He says, or he asks, for Dr. McDonald, why does Baba Kama, the Talmud, quote Sirach as belonging to the writings and use it as, um, as it is written, if this was not considered scripture by Jews? Uh I think Sirach was considered scripture, and I, I've listed in some of my writings a number of examples where it was considered scripture. It was the debatable book. Uh, uh, Sirach was the primary text outside of the uh, Hebrew Bible, the Tanakh uh, that we have today, that was considered uh, as scripture by some Jews. He's, he's quite right in that, uh, that assessment, but eventually uh, it could be uh, that they rejected it on the basis, and there's one rabbinic text, because it had the actual name of the author in it, and they wanted to have non-named books. Uh, though uh, that isn't true for all of the books that are found in the uh, Hebrew Bible, but that was one of the questions that, that was raised. It's uh, You raise a good question, and I, I, I raised it in a conference in uh, Jerusalem, and uh, was told I didn't know what I was talking about. I said, you may be right, but I do. Uh, here's a list. Uh, I have a list of 70 references to Sirach in the rabbinic traditions in Jerusalem and also in Babylon and, uh, and also in the uh, Tosefta as well as the um, uh, Mishnah, it's even mentioned. So those are the kinds of uh, questions that are reasonable to ask uh, how come it didn't make it in it's a wonderful book and uh, there's nothing heretical in it and uh, I'm glad we have it uh, and that it's it's still available I've read through it many times and uh, I find something new that I hadn't thought about uh, each time I read it the next one is from Buck he says in the Nicene post Nicene fathers one of Schaff's footnotes says that the Ecumenical Council of Ephesus in 431 quotes Sirach 3219 as, quote, divinely inspired scripture says, end quote. What are your thoughts on this? Well, I think uh, you'll find examples even before Nicene uh, of Sirach being quoted as scripture. I, I don't have any questions about that. Uh, uh, and you find it after that. And those that accepted the Deuterocanonicals uh, the, the books in the Septuagint. The Septuagint was the first Bible of the church, the books that comprised the Septuagint. Most churches didn't have a copy of all of them, but uh, they did have some, and that was a popular book. And it's in almost all of the uh, listings of uh, 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 canonical uh, lists that survive. Uh, Sirach and Wisdom and Judith and Tobit are almost always in there, and sometimes first and second uh, uh, Esdras, and sometimes first and second uh, Maccabees, and some actually have all four of the Maccabees uh, in there. The next question Did is, I, uh, oh, I'm sorry, feel, go ahead. Feel free, I, feel free if I didn't answer the questioner, I may not have understood it, so. no. No, you, that Go ahead. good. Uh, this one is, or, this one is from Ave Christus Rex again. He says, where did Jerome get the notion Judith was deemed canonical scripture at the Council of Nicaea? There was no discussion of uh, uh, which books were in or out at the Council of Nicaea. It was primarily a Christological issued uh, council. The, the major issue was there. There was no a decision made on the scope of the Christian uh, scriptures at the Council of Nicaea. The first time you see that is if you attribute it uh, correctly to about 360 AD as the Council of Laodicea, but the 60th uh, canon in that has a listing of the books, and that may have been 20 years later or even 30 years later. But the Council at Rome in 382 was uh, uh, a, one of the earlier listings uh, after uh, uh, Athanasius was not at a council, he gave his own opinion as to which books were in and out. And I think his was the first listing of Second Peter 
but uh, the councils that dealt specifically with the books that are in the scriptures along with other items. Most of the time when the people met as a council, they had more than just uh, which books are in and which books are not in. But uh, those are generally local councils, like at Hippo and Carthage and Rome. Uh, those are the, the places. And then you see subsequent uh, lists that begin to emerge after that. And interestingly, talking about pseudepigrapha, <clears throat> Uh, some of the lists were created and made to look like they were earlier. And uh, there's an excellent uh, article by uh, Claire Rothschild on uh, uh, the Muratorian fragment that so many scholars want to put in the second century. And she has, I think, rightly shown uh, there's too much in it to show that, uh, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> uh, that shows that the, uh, the author of the Muratorian fragment was trying to produce a fraudulent document at the uh, in the late fourth century, early fifth, and the evidence of that is that there's the only references to uh, Hermas being the brother of uh, Bishop Pius Pius in Rome. Uh, there's all of those emerge in the fourth century. Uh, Miltiades, who's called heretical. And the Muratorian fragment is called, uh, is spoken of with a great praise uh, from Tertullian all the way through, uh, uh, even Eusebius does, and he's not looked upon as a, a heretic until much later. And then the Cotophrygians that are mentioned in the Muratorian fragment, uh, they're not uh, uh, mentioned as Cotophrygians until the fourth century, and Eusebius mentions both Cotophrygians and uh, Montanus. They're called Montanus in the second century. So I don't put it, uh, the Muratorian fragment there, but uh, Claire Rothschilds has a marvelous book that's just come out, and she's written a couple of articles on the subject, and she tries to show that uh, uh, pseudepigrapha was very rampant in the second uh, century and third century churches, produced a lot of it, and this was one of those uh, examples. But again, uh, there was nothing at Nicaea that spoke about the scope of the scriptures, but there were those uh, before Nicaea and after Nicaea, and I'm thinking of Tertullian and uh, uh, Cyprian in uh, Carthage who uh, who cited uh, the Deuterocanonical text and even Enoch uh, as scripture. Origins about the last one that calls it scripture, but he still liked it even later. Uh, and there's some portions of it he thought were Christian, or they advanced the uh, Christian tradition. So anyway, I don't know if that gets to the question, no. but uh, yeah. It, it does, and there's a few more chat questions, and William also has uh, one last question for you. Uh, Dr. McDonald, I personally have to head out, so what I'm going to do is pass it over to William, and he'll take it from okay. here and wrap things up. But thank you so much for okay. being on, Dr. McDonald. I'm sorry that I have to leave a little early. Oh. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you. Michael, you, you're, you're incredible as usual. Yeah, we, we're, we're not going to go a whole lot longer, Dr. McDonald, but I did have one, uh, one question that I, I, and I know I've talked to you about it before. Uh, we've dialogued about it. Uh, maybe pick your brain for the audience here. Uh, earlier, before we began the show, we were talking briefly about um, the Council of Rome and then looking at Carthage and Hippo. You were pointing out how the Carthage, of, um, uh, the Council of Rome, the uh, the list um, is very indicative of, of what we will see later on at Trent, Florence, and Trent. I have one question for you, Dr. McDonald. It, if you look at the Council of Rome 382, you notice you've got all of the Deuterocanonical books there, but you don't have Baruch. Would Baruch have been rolled up with Jeremiah? Yep. Often Baruch uh, and the Epistle of Jeremiah are uh, uh, included within the uh, uh, Jeremiah uh, tradition, but uh, uh, you're right. Uh, it's sometimes there and sometimes isn't, and I don't have a clue on what the decisions were. I'm only familiar with the, with the list, but not the uh, rationale for the list. And all of the Deuterocanonicals are not mentioned either at uh, the 382 uh, meeting in Rome or the uh, uh, 393, 397, and 416 to 19. 
uh, at Carthage, the hippo and the Carthage. Uh, uh, they just don't list all of them. And uh, I don't have all of those in front of me. I'm, I'm just going from memory at this point but uh do, do, you, do you know what what has been missing I, I i was under the impression that um that carthage and hippo did have what would amount to um what would amount to being what uh, what we would what we as catholics would call the florentine canon and then later the canon of trent uh are sure. you aware of, of what would uh, are you aware of anything that would differ maybe when we look at no. we look at rome Okay, I get you. I misunderstood. So you you do agree no, no, that when I, we look I, at Rome, I, I, yeah, oh, I, I think I, I think Rome, uh, the three eighty two conference uh, influenced uh, my feeling, and the reason I I say that is because of the uh, constant uh, contacts between Rome and Carthage, uh, Tertullian uh, and uh, especially Augustine, but the uh, councils at uh, uh, Hippo and Carthage, uh, they say at the tail end, A, that uh, uh, this will be approved by, and, and they talk, speak of this transmaritime uh, uh, trip they got to go, which is Rome. Everybody knows that's Rome. Uh, they yeah. need to get some yeah. approval off over in that direction. So d did Rome influence uh, their decisions? Probably, because they're pretty close. They're not too far apart. The same thing is true. I think that the uh, uh, the Trent is very close uh, to uh, those. It's not exact, but it's very close. The only thing at Rome, uh, uh, sorry, the Council of Trent, is that it puts an anathema on people that doesn't agree with it. I got you. So, 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 so yeah, that would, that, that would be what you would talk about, really. The, so, the really, the only difference you would talk about would be the anathema, basically. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, okay. uh, essentially, now, uh, some of the books may have varied uh, and one of them uh, at the Council of Carthage, besides after they list the books and they include some of the Deuterocanonicals, they also put the uh, the passing of the martyrs would also be, uh, all of the others were for reading in church. And they said, it's okay to read that in the church as well. And I think, okay. I think that was that's an interesting uh, point to make. And I didn't, that part is not found at uh uh, the Florentine uh, Council, uh, if there was a council, and that's a question in my mind. You may know more about that than I do. Yeah, oh, but there, also, there definitely yeah. was, yeah. Okay, then uh, Trent, uh, that goes, uh, uh, the passing of the martyrs is not uh, listed to be read in the churches. So uh, that was just something unique about the uh, uh, Hippo and Carthage uh, uh, councils. They had councils almost every year on something. Uh, they loved councils, <laughs> councils in those uh, in that time. Uh, but you, I'm sure you know more about that. I haven't looked at the Florentine outside of just uh, some of the texts. And uh, I, a friend of mine, uh, Juan Carlos, uh, oh goodness, he teaches at the uh, Pontifical University at uh, St. Croesus in uh, Rome, uh, Osandan is his last name. Uh, he brought that to my attention on the Florentine uh, uh, text, and uh, I greatly appreciate it. And they gave me an invitation. I spoke over there uh, at their at their school a couple of years ago. But uh, there's an awful lot that we just don't know. And I, I depend on my Catholic scholars to give me a clue about some of what took place at some of those <laughs> I, uh, I, I'm familiar with the lists that came out. I've got a bunch of lists, but all of the uh, negotiations that went into those lists, uh, that's beyond my scope of uh, competence at this point. I, I think even if that may be beyond your scope of, of knowledge or what have you, Dr. McDonald, I, you've been incredible. Uh, your, your, your affirmation of what we essentially have within Rome, Carthage, and Hippo, spot on and really reiterating what you and myself have talked about before in the past and i mean i've got to be honest with you dr mcdonald i love talking about the canon and um i know we're going to wrap up in a few moments but uh I, my very close one of my best friends uh I'm, I'm blast having him on gary when we talk about when we talk i mean we can go hours talking about the canon <laughs> as well but we but before we wrap up um gary would you like to ask dr mcdonald anything else um 
Uh, off the top of my head, no. Uh, all I can say, Dr. McDonald, is uh, you're at the top of my list of uh, recommended authors on the subject. So, uh, you know, I, oh. I hold you in very high esteem. And, and again, I'd just like to thank you for all your hard work. Well, that's very kind of you. And I, one of the things that I like to do, and if you'll permit me uh, in wrapping up, I, I have a lot of colleagues that talk about canon, but it's not what the canon of the church was, which was a rule or an authority. Whichever collection of books that you recognize as an authority, I could live with any one of them. If I were born in Syria, I'd, I'd have a different one. But having said that, if it doesn't have an impact upon the way that you live and believe and comport yourself, then it's not canon yet. Uh, canon is an authoritative guide. The first canon of the church was Jesus. And everything yeah. flowed. From, uh, and the Old Testament was understood in light of who Jesus was, primarily, not exclusively. And then the apostolic tradition, those were the ones closest to Jesus. And uh, the earliest... Uh, uh, scriptures that uh, were cited by the church, they went back to see what was uh, spoken by Jesus in the scriptures that he cited. He didn't cite all of the Old Testament texts, but he cited about two-thirds of them that are found in the New Testament, and the early church did the same. He primarily focused on uh, Isaiah, the Psalms, and Deuteronomy. And uh, uh, those are the kinds of things that I try to share with folks Whenever you've gone through and you realize that the subject is a complex one, don't forget the meaning of canon. If you say that you uh, have affirmed uh, certain books for your canon, then for pity's sake, live by them. That's what they're there for. Yeah, yeah incredible. Amen. That was fantastic, Dr. Dr. McDonald. Very, very good. Gr uh, greatly appreciate you uh, coming on and joining us. And... I can tell the audience that I, we will definitely have you on again. Uh, Dr. McDonald will definitely have you back on. I'll reach back out to you and we'll talk. I mean, there's so much more they could talk about. We barely scratched the surface. We'll ha definitely have you on again and we'll pick your brain on the canon oh. of the middle age period. I can't wait to have you on again, Dr. McDonald. Okay. Well, you'd be amazed at all the ways I can say I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, you were great. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you very much. I appreciated the time. Thank you very much. And everybody, okay. uh, thank you very much for joining in. Um, make sure to like, subscribe, share this. Thank you very much for joining in. And uh, we have another incredible show for you tomorrow evening. And uh, hopefully you all will definitely be able to tune in. Thank Gary, thank you for joining us. And uh, I don't know, I think Michael might have popped on at the very, very end there. Um, but anyway, we have uh, we have already wrapped up. Dr. McDonald, you were great. Thank you very much, and um, you all have a great Thank evening. You.